And welcome to Gimme Five. I'm your host, Jack Peterson. And today, we're going to look at the history of juggling. Juggling goes back about 4,000 years. And throughout much of this history, jugglers were actually considered outcasts. <laughs> Go figure. Although juggling was a fabulous form of entertainment, the performers themselves were not socially accepted. The oldest known depiction of juggling was found in the Beni Hassan tombs from the Middle Kingdom of ancient Egyptian civilization. These women jugglers were found amongst acrobats and dancers in one of the crypt's wall paintings. The drawing itself was made about 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. After the Beni Hassan tombs, there's a gap of about 1,500 years before evidence of juggling reappears in the art of the Greeks. Between the 4th and 5th centuries BC, many jugglers began appearing in Greek art, usually as pottery decoration. Juggling was considered a form of recreation by the Greeks, and many of its practitioners were women. The Romans were fond of manipulations with weapons and shields. We're here in the green screen of the uh, Media Center for Art, Education, and Technology. We're using here the, uh, the floor that I can show you. Uh, as a kid, I learned how to juggle on a driveway. It had a slight incline, and the speed of the balls, it was really slow, and that's what you need to know here. You throw the ball up against the incline. When it reaches the top, that's the apex. When it stops and comes back, that's your cue to throw the next ball, just like this. Stop, throw it. Stops, throw it. You can do this really slow. It takes a little bit of concentration but it's really easy to get the pattern in your head. And once you get it uh, down on this, you can graduate to a, you know, a, a pool table with billiard balls, and then you can start throwing them in the air. And before you know it, you're juggling, all right? A great way to learn. Something small, slight slope like that, a little bit of incline, you're off and juggling. Let's continue our quick juggling lesson from horizontal to vertical. We're off the floor, we're standing up. Let's start with one ball. It's pretty easy. You just throw it around. It's no big deal. Juggling two is just like juggling one, except there's one more. A lot of people will juggle two like this, which is okay. Technically, it's juggling. But a true juggle of two balls would be a figure eight pattern, much like this. Pretty easy. Pretty simple. Work on it. Juggling three is just like juggling two, except there's one more. A lot of patterns you can do. Figure eights. Little cascading, be creative. How about under the leg, around the back? Or now let's advance to four balls. Juggling four balls is just like juggling three, except there's one more. Let's check it out. Get the pattern going here. Now we can juggle five, six, seven, and eight, but I say forget that. Let's go right to nine golf balls. Nine golf balls ready to rock. Here we go. You got your nine golf balls in your hand, the easiest thing to do is juggle. Piece of cake. Since the 1950s, juggling has regained its popularity as a recreation. And who knows, it might just stick around for a while. One thing is for sure though, juggling remains as hypnotic today as it did 40 centuries ago. For Gimme Five, I'm Jack Peterson. Welcome to Gimme Five, I'm Jack, and here we are at Lula's Chocolate Factory in Monterey. We're with the owner, it's Scott Lund, and he's gonna show us how to make Rocky, Rocky Road. Road, one of my favorites. And uh, I guess it's relatively easy. We could probably do this at home. Very easy. Yes, you can do it at home. That's why we're teaching you how to do it. Best chocolate, best nuts, best marshmallows. All right, where do we start? Well, what we're gonna do, Rocky Road, of course, are nuts, chocolate, and marshmallows. Now, we recommend and we use macadamia nuts because they're softer. A lot of people use almonds from California. They taste great, but they're not, they're, uh, sometimes they're a little bit too hard for our Rocky Road. We also use a, the premium chocolate, and I'll get some more uh, later. And then we use marshmallows that we make ourselves. The first thing you want to do is, and the hardest thing, is to make sure that you have tempered chocolate. So what we've got here is chocolate that's been ground up. 
And then in a double boiler in the other room, we'll have some uh, melted chocolate. It's about 105 degrees. So this is where we keep our double boiler. And this is where we make all of our other great chocolates that uh, are available at the different stores where we sell. But basically, you'd have your own double boiler, you'd get your own chocolate, and then you bring it into the other room where it's a little bit cooler. So if you were at home, what you would do is get chocolate out of your double boiler. It's melted, you don't want it anything higher than about 105 degrees, 110 degrees at the tops. You put that in the bowl. The other thing you're gonna need is a uh, pan with some parchment paper or wax paper. You take that chocolate, what we're gonna do is we're gonna drop the temperature and we're gonna temper the chocolate. That means set the right crystal structure of the chocolate. If we don't do this step, the chocolate will not set up hard quick enough and what we'll get is chocolate that blooms over time. The cocoa butter will come out and it will look like we left our rocky road in our car and then we put it in the refrigerator. But you can see that it's mostly dissolved at this point. That's gonna be in temper at this point and as soon as we put it on this tray and stop mixing it, it's gonna set up hard in six minutes. Okay, so you check it. It's, it's still warm, but not hot. So this, this became the seed. It melted, but didn't destroy the crystal. We're gonna add some marshmallow now. And I've taken some larger ones and cut them up. You can use small ones that you buy at home, or you can use big ones and cut them up. You don't want them necessarily falling all over the place. But this is live TV. So we're gonna mix this up. We're gonna try and cover everything. What I know about Rocky Road is you can always add more marshmallows later, and you can always add more nuts. So don't add too many at the beginning until you've had some experience. But you can see that they're now fully covered. And could you explain tempering again? Okay, tempering is where you set the right chocolate crystal so that it sets up hard in six minutes. And it sets up hard and nice and shiny. I'm gonna put this off camera. Then with clean hands, and I've washed my hands before, I'm gonna make sure that I grab a couple nuts and a couple pieces of marshmallow. And I'm just gonna put it on the tray. Let me see if I can make sure that's in the shot. Okay. So I've got three macadamia nuts and a couple marshmallows. And if you like nuts more, put more nuts. The trick is to do this fast at this point because in six minutes it's going to be hard. Hard to work with and it won't look as nice. But the tempering is it's almost like cement. You want to, it's a crystal structure. It makes the, the chocolate nice and hard. If it's in temper it's nice and shiny. It doesn't matter really what it looks like. It's nice if it's pretty but you know, if you and your kids are doing it, it really doesn't matter because what matters is it, that it tastes great and it's going to taste great. Don't worry if it's not in temper the first time because it takes a lot of practice. The first piece that I put down is cooling and it's becoming uh, more, I guess, opaque is the term. Okay, so you just keep doing that. But that's how you make Rocky Road. And, and now you can definitely see that the second one that I did is almost entirely hard. There's a couple spots. But because it, the chocolate's in temper, the cocoa butter doesn't have a chance to come out of, um, of the chocolate mix and it won't lay on top and it's gonna be nice and shiny and beautiful to eat. Let me ask you, where can we get Lula's chocolates? Well, Lula's is available on the, uh, in Monterey, of course, on the Monterey Peninsula in several different locations. Uh, it's available at Whole Foods what used to be Clementine's Kitchen, Stone Creek Kitchen, Bruno's Nielsen's, uh, at the factory, or at our Crossroads store, and online, lulas.com. There we go, that's your, that's your plug for the day. That's my plug for the day. Enjoy the, uh, the uh, Rocky Road, have a great time with it, and um, I wish you all the best. Hello and welcome to Gimme Five. I'm your host, Jack Peterson. Today we're hanging out in Salinas. We're at Bear Bicycles. We're gonna get into the swing of the season with bicycle safety, maintenance, and everything you need to know to get your bike ready for the season. Let's talk to the owner. It's Brian Williams. He's gonna come riding in here with a bike. Brian, nice to meet you. 
Thanks okay. for letting us come by and no tell us what do we need to know about getting your bike ready for the season? Well, it depends basically on the type of bike you're trying to get ready, but if it's a bike that hasn't been ridden in a while, always check the air pressure. I'd check the chain. If you rotate the cranks backwards on just about any bike, it should roll freely. Might need to be lubricated. Um, it should be taut. It shouldn't be hanging around loose. Make sure your chain tension is good. You should get about a half an inch of flex going up and down on a single speed like this or something like a cruiser. Um, going into a mountain bike, chain tension is completely different. Um, if you sit and you turn the wheel sideways, you shouldn't be able to rock the handlebars back and forth. It should feel like a solid unit. If you take and drop the bike, you shouldn't be hearing any obvious <laughs> rattling sounds. The only sound you hear right now is when the actual cable hits the frame. You're not hearing any loose rattling sounds. You don't have any play side to side in your wheels. Um, you don't have any play side to side in the cranks. All of those are indicative of a problem or a problem that's occurring. Um, check headset, see if it's loose. So in here, if you get play back and forth, it's really not good for you or the bike. Um, cranks, grab your wheels, move them side to side, see if anything has play in it. Feels like it shouldn't if you get rattles where they shouldn't be. That would probably be the most basic safety check at that point. Coming into other things, if you want to get into gears, your chain even becomes more critical. And then condition of cables and housing becomes more critical. Um, you've got more moving parts that need to be adjusted that if they're not aligned or if they're not clean, they don't work too well. We can do just a check over, just to do basically what I just mentioned, mm -hmm. or we could do like if you need, if it needs more, we can do what we would call a full tune up, where we basically put a wrench on every nut and bolt on the bike, make sure everything's adjusted the way it should be, true the wheels, adjust the brakes, bottom bracket, headset, hubs, gears, all of that. Um, and that's something that's a little more involved, takes a little more time. A simple checkup might just take five, 10 minutes, where a tune up is you know, could take us half a day or more. And it's probably worth the money considering what could happen to you if, you're, if you don't. Well, exactly, and it also depends on how often the bike gets ridden, ridden and the higher your expectations of what you're riding. Um, something like this wouldn't need a tune-up as much as like a mountain bike or a road bike that has gears. Um, there's a lot more moving parts. Um, you get into like full suspension bikes, obviously a lot more moving parts, a lot more maintenance critical, a lot harder to adjust. I guess the biggest thing for bicycle safety is awareness, watching where you're going and what you're doing. If you're not paying attention to what you're doing, you're more likely to have a problem than if someone who's basically riding their bike defensively. For safety's sake, be very aware of cars, always wear a helmet, and always be aware of your surroundings. A big thank you to Brian Williams at Bear Bikes in Salinas for helping out on this segment. That's it for Gimme 5. If you have a suggestion for one of these segments, drop me a line at gimme5 at mcaet.org. Hello, I'm Jack, this is Gimme 5, and in this segment today, we're gonna take a look at the life of a tarantula. I actually have some experience in this arena as I owned a Chilean rose-haired tarantula for 26 years. I thought if I had a child, they would have moved out by now and probably been on their own. Maybe have some grandkids, but no, I had a tarantula. Zombie is a Chilean rose-haired tarantula, scientifically known as the Gramostola rosea. They can grow to an average of five to six inches. Males are significantly smaller. The tarantula is not recommended for a first-time pet owner. Tarantulas are reclusive pets and should not be handled frequently. Now, while they're easy to care for and they're an inexpensive pet, they're not a good pet for children. Some types of tarantulas are known to cause rashes. This is because their hairs come off easily when they're stressed or threatened. Hang on for a second. Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, right there, right there. Oh yeah. If you're looking for a pet that does not require a lot of personal attention or costly maintenance, the tarantula may be for you. Tarantulas do well in 10 gallon aquariums with a small water bowl and a secure locking screen. Tarantulas can climb glass. Be sure to provide a reptile heating pad under the tank for a heat source. It should cover about half the tank. It's feeding time. When I fed my spider, I often wondered what was going through the cricket's mind while roaming free in the enclosure. I wonder what that would sound like. Wow, this is kind of nice. 
Lots of room in here. The soft, silky ground is nice to walk on. Hi, who are you? I'm Bob. Did you get an invitation for lunch too? I'm hungry. Where's the food? Go back to the castle. Okay. Turn left and look for the tunnel. Over here? Yeah, right there. Now, now just go back to the tunnel a little further. Am I there yet? A little more. A little more? Keep going. Bon appetit. Tarantulas molt at least three times per year. This means they shed their old skin for a new one. You may notice your tarantula not eating for a few days or up to a couple weeks prior to molting. The bald spot on their abdomen may start to turn black as well and you, you may notice a color change. If you notice your tarantula on its back, do not disturb it. This is what tarantulas do in order to molt. They spin a web on the ground, lay on top of the web upside down from four to 10 hours. Then their abdomen pops, they climb out, they leave their exoskeleton, and you have to wait like two days after they molt until the new skin hardens. So you don't want to feed them or handle them for at least two days after they molt. It's really not a good idea to handle your tarantula frequently. If you must pick it up, put your hand on the bottom of the cage and let the tarantula walk onto your hand. Keep the tarantula close to the ground or table. It's very dangerous for a tarantula to fall from any height. Their abdomens are very easily ruptured and they can bleed to death. No need to get all creeped out by tarantulas or any spider for that matter. They're actually pretty cool critters. And if you want to find out more about spiders and tarantulas, check out the web. <laughs> the, the web? Uh, I thought it was funny. Find out what's going on here at the Media Center for Art, Education, and Technology at the website mcaet.org. That's it for now. We'll see you next time on Gimme 5. On this educational segment of Gimme 5, we'll take a look at how they use math at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Let's check in with water quality specialist Eric Kingsley. My full job title is water quality specialist, but basically I'm the staff chemist here. I'm responsible for designing all of our methods for analyzing for different parameters that are in the water. Um, mostly we're interested in the nitrogen cycle. Uh, the fish are swimming in the same water that they happen to be going to the bathroom in. So if you don't have lots and lots of clean water flushing through, you, one of the concerns is having ammonia buildup. I use math pretty much every day. Every type of measurement you do, you have to understand some type of math. It's used here at the aquarium, figuring out concentrations of a parameter of a flow rate. So we'll go out in the morning, we'll collect all of our samples, we'll bring them back and we'll run various tests. This particular test happens to be a nitrite analysis. Once a month I run a new standard curve so I can compare known values to unknown values. So in this rack over here, starting in the beginning, these are blanks and these are known standards. That's why this one's really, really dark. The darker the color, the more nitrite that's in the sample. We use what is called an auto sampler. We put them in racks here. This is the auto sampler here. Under computer control, this needle will drive around and it'll be lowered into one of these tubes. Then the computer will tell this pump to start pumping right here. The sample will come through this tubing, through this flow cell, and out. Once the tubing is full, it'll stop the pump. A shutter will open, it will send light through the sample from this side, and then from over here, there's a detector. By measuring the amount of light going out and the amount of light coming in, we can figure out the concentration of nitrite in the sample. And this is all controlled by this computer and this little uh, program over here. Okay, um, what we were just doing over at the computer, it was actually doing all the math for us. To give you an idea of what's going behind the scenes, if we have a little light source right here, it's going to shine light through our flow cell. And we'll have a detector over here, I just drew an eye, but it, there's actually a machine that will measure in the amount of light accurately. By looking at the amount of light coming into the flow cell compared to the amount of light going out, the logarithmic ratio of that is called absorbance. And everything, pretty much everything we do that uses the spectrophotometer that you saw a little while ago is using this type of math. My name is Evan Tyler. I'm an aquarist here. I work in conjunction with Eric Kingsley, who is testing water samples from this exhibit. Um, of primary concern um, for our planted tanks are the plants. They need to be fertilized and they have to be precise. We did a conversion from 400 gallons 
to leaders. We discovered that there are 1,514 liters in 400 gallons. Next, we had to determine how many 50s there were in 1,514 liters. It turns out there's 30.28 50s in 1,514 liters. We can take that 30 and multiply it by the recommended dosage of five milliliters. So 30 times five is 150 milliliters of micronutrients. If any of you students out there ever just think you might be interested in a job in marine chemistry or aquarium industry, definitely take the math. I use algebra, I use calculus all the time. It's actually very useful. Math is used everywhere in the world, and especially in jobs like this. Personally, for me, it's how I make my living, and I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't think it was fun. Welcome to Gimme 5, I'm Jack. Today, we're traveling to Budapest, Hungary for our gastronomic journey. Where is Hungary? Let's travel to the other side of the world. You are here. You'll notice that Hungary looks like a big piece of chicken fried steak. We're gonna zoom into Budapest and the Parliament. That's the Danube River. And there we go, the Parliament in Budapest on the Danube River. Our guest today is Susie Faluchkai Dennis. She is from the beautiful country of Hungary and she is gonna share with us her old family recipe of chicken paprika. I'm gonna act as her translator and sous chef. Hello Susie and welcome. She said the weather in Alaska is sunny and cool today. I did not say that. What, what did you say? <laughs> but I said that I'm very happy to introduce my grandmother's old recipe of chicken paprika. Okay. So let's get to work. Let's get started. First we have to cut up a tray of boneless, skinless chicken thigh. Now why, you're talking chicken thighs here, why wouldn't we use boneless, skinless chicken breasts? It would be healthier, less fat, and it's probably as good as uh, anything else, but the original recipe is with red meat, redder meat. Okay. So that's why we are using the boneless, skinless chicken thighs. thighs. We got it. Use about two tablespoons of oil. I use olive oil because it's much healthier than any other oil. Heat it up. Once the oil is heated, we stir it in and cook it until it's translucent. Or you can see through it. <laughs> uh, for better taste, and this is optional, okay. um, one or two tiny chopped bell pepper. This is a yellow one or orange colored one, but any type of bell pepper would do it. So if you mix this one into the uh, the onion and just cook it together uh, that would be perfect so once the onion is done uh, we're gonna mix in two tablespoons of paprika now this is the essential part of the chicken paprika um, because if you overcook the paprika then it's gonna be bitter but if you undercook it then it's not going to get the flavor that the chicken paprika is supposed to have. So you have to be very careful um, not to overcook and not to undercook it. It takes about 30 seconds on uh, almost high heat to sort of kind of burn or caramelize the paprika. And then once it's done, then you just mix the chicken in. Put it back and stir it a few times so it's evenly cooked a little bit. Still on almost on high or medium high. Now you put salt and uh, black pepper to taste. Reduce the heat to medium. Here's the black pepper. Again, it's just as much as you normally would use. And again, optional to put some fresh tomato in the stew right now. You can buy this type of paprika. It's a, a Hungarian paprika. And this one um, is sold in 
international markets and also I saw it in Safeway. So if you can find this, this is good too. So from that point, you just uh, cover the stew and pretty much let it cook. It takes about 15-20 minutes uh, cooking time to well cook the chicken. You cover it on medium to low heat, uh, cook it and occasionally stir it. After you finish cooking about 15 to 20 minutes, then you are ready to stir um, sour cream or plain yogurt. Plain yogurt would be much healthier, so uh, this is yogurt. Um, you stir it in and then cook together about two minutes and then you are done with the stew. As a side dish, uh, we are going to use a whole grain uh, penne pasta, but it's up to you. You can use any sort of pasta. It's really good with brown rice. It's really wonderful with any type of pasta. Uh, as I said, I'm using the whole grain because I think it's healthier. So you are going to serve it and we are showing it on the top of the pasta. Hope you learned a lot here on Gimme 5 with our Hungarian uh, dish, chicken paprikash. Big thank you to Susie Faluchkai Dennis for uh, giving us the recipe, the family recipe. How do you say bon appetit in Hungarian? Jó étvágyat. There you go. Let's dig in. That's it for today. We'll see you next time on Gimme 5.